um, because this is actually uh, not just a highly engaging event with a lot of successful ladies and gentlemen in the room, but it's, a, it's, it's an interesting opportunity for certainly me and others, no doubt, to speak about their journeys. But actually, I think for some of us as speakers and guests here this evening, to get a bit of a reality check as to you know, what it is like for women in the corporate world, the business world, and obviously this evening, the political world as well. As you heard from my introduction, um, I am a member of parliament, I'm a new member of parliament, so I was elected in 2010. And up until my point of election, I had a normal day job, I worked in the corporate world, I worked internationally. And like our hosts here tonight, KPMG, you know, a large international firm, I've had that experience too. I've worked alongside mainly men, um, not enough women, there's no doubt about that, at chief executive level, at chairman level, and at board level. And I have been able to influence a range of decisions. I've worked with stakeholders around the world, I've worked with governments around the world. And I think one of the starkest and harshest realities is, is that it is still very much a world and an environment, the corporate world, that is dominated by men. And I use this term that sometimes it feels like it's not what you know, but it's about who you know. And the reason why tonight is so important, I think, for all us women here, is because it's about the networks that we can create. And through these networks, of course, we can mentor, we can support each other, and actually we can do what those guys do for each other, which is sometimes and occasionally open doors and support each other to get on in life and climb that ladder. And I have to say, one of the things that I have come up against in the corporate world, and I'll come on into to the political world shortly, is that every now and then you do find women who do make it, not quite to the top, but reach <laughs> significant echelons, and unfortunately, the culture has been that they sometimes move that ladder away and do not enough to encourage the next generation of women to come forward. And if nothing else, in my 10 years plus in the corporate world, for me, the whole concept of succession planning and bringing on new generation, the next generation, new women, bringing on talent is absolutely key. It really is. And I think as we've heard already this evening, it's not about quotas, it's not about targets, it's an insult to even use the term chicken boxes. The talent out there is limitless, it really is. And actually I think it's the job of women in the corporate world, in business, in public life, in politics, to actually start raising the game and start opening the door to bring in more talent. And the interesting thing about the year that I was elected was 2010. I, I was reading earlier on today, I mean, I, you know, it's Davos, it is the World Economic Forum that's taking place right now, and that's a forum that I'm familiar with because I've been to it in the past. And the very year that I was elected in 2010, there was actually the World Economic Forum Gender Gap Report. Now, I hate that terminology, gender gap, you know, that it's women over there and men over there. But it was an incredible survey of something like 600 heads of human resources in some of the largest corporations in the world. And I'm sure none of you here will be surprised about what they discovered. I mean, they discovered that, of course, there was a gender gap. I mean, you know, hence the reason why it's called that. But actually, the interesting aspects were those countries that were effectively doing pretty well in making sure that women were represented in the workplace and in senior levels. Of course, it was countries like America, but at the same time, Spain, Finland, Canada had the highest percentage of women employees amongst the senior level, the corporate level. And unsurprisingly, Rina touched on India. You know, I think our hearts sink when we look at India and the sort of cultural aspects around the way and the attitudes towards women. India was one of the lowest in the world, um, unsurprisingly, but actually countries like Japan were too. But it's not just about the countries, it's actually about the sectors and professions too. Um, women do well in service sectors, but then when you look at them from an economic point of view, they, they're not there in automotive, engineering, and mining, agriculture. And I do think in this day and age, if nothing else, it is now 2013, women are pushing the boundaries. You know, we don't fit stereotypes anymore. It is up to us to start challenging boundaries and the conventional norms around what type of professions we want to work in. And actually, I think we are starting to do that. 
which now brings me on to politics, certainly as the Conservative Party's first female Asian MP. That's not a role or, pos or position that I just landed automatically. I have been an active member of the Conservative Party for over 20 years. That's where I hope there's a deep intake of breath and people think, crikey, but that is a fact, that's a reality. And I just joined the Conservative Party partly because of my family and the values of my families, which was very much about supporting our community, supporting our country. My parents were immigrants to this country. And really, the Conservative Party for us was the type of party that wanted to support us and get on in life. And so those are the shared values, the shared social norms that we had, and I certainly had an affinity with the Conservative Party during the time when Margaret Thatcher was not just leading the party, but she was Prime Minister. And actually, if nothing else, I think having a first female Prime Minister leading a political party that you actually share common ground and values with probably motivated me, actually, to say, I want to be a part of that. And actually, that's alongside having an outstanding local member of Parliament who just happened to be in her cabinet as well at the same time, and that was Cecil Parkinson, and he was her closest political aide and confidant, really did encourage me and got me involved in the grassroots. In fact, it was Cecil Parkinson that wrote me a personal note and said, I think you should be joining our party when I was about 18. And that is exactly what I did. Now, I didn't join the Conservative Party thinking that I ever wanted to be a member of Parliament. I mean, for me, that just wasn't even something that featured into my head. My parents were small business people. And actually, I think for those of us that come from, A, immigrant families, but also with a business background in our families, you're even more determined and self-motivated to get on in life and want to be successful. Yes, you have failures, but actually you pick yourselves up from those failures and you move onwards. Um, and I guess I apply that analogy to everything that I've done since. And certainly, I've had a political interest throughout my 20 years as a member of the Conservative Party. And during that time, I decided I wanted to work in corporate comms, in media, in communications, in business strategies. And I worked my way into those avenues of public life through business life. I was also at one point William Hague's Deputy Press Secretary. And again, that's not a position you land overnight. You work very hard within what is a very male environment, because the Conservative Party was back then, just after the 1997 general election, to actually demonstrate that actually I'm as good as anybody else for that job. And there's no reason why I can't do that job. I can add value, I have skills, I have experience, I have insights, and actually I have the sheer force of determination and force of personality to be successful in that job, and that's what I wanted to do. So I think part of my message this evening you know, we can challenge the social norms, and actually we must push the boundaries all the time. We used to use the term glass ceiling, and I remember the day that I was appointed as William Hayes Deputy Press Secretary, somebody said to me within the Conservative Party, you have just shattered one of the greatest glass ceilings in this party. We've not had somebody in that kind of role before, and certainly not someone who's female and of an Asian background. And actually, that was one of the things that motivated me more and more to say, well, actually, I'm going to go for everything that I want to go for, and nothing will hold me back. And you become more and more determined. So in terms of how I actually became a member of Parliament, well, some of you may realise that after the 1997 election, the Conservative Party had a pretty gloomy outlook, and we were out of office for something like 13 years because the Labour Party were running the show. But during those 13 years, I was active in the party. I supported my party through some gritty times. I worked at the grassroots. I also worked just alongside some very senior politicians as well. And one of them, and then in fact that was Ian Duncan Smith when he was leader of the Conservative Party, just sort of suggested that I might want to stand and become a member of parliament at some stage. And I, I was working in the corporate world, I wasn't quite married, I didn't have a family at that stage. And I thought, well, you know what, I see no reason why not, I'm going to give it a go. So I stood in the 2005 general election in a completely non-conservative seat, nowhere near where I lived, and that seat was Nottingham North, um, so quite a few miles away from home. And it was an incredible experience for me. Yes, I was on my own, raising money, campaigning, knocking on doors, doing all that kind of stuff as you do. 
But actually, and I knew that I was not going to win that, that election, I knew that I was not going to wake up on the day of, the day of polling day or the day after the general election as a member of Parliament for Muslim North. But actually, it made me focused and determined and say that I can do this. I want to stand for public office and I want to be involved in public life. And so afterwards, not long after that election, David Cameron became leader of the Conservative Party. And actually, at that point in time, that was the ultimate game changer. Because David Cameron was absolutely committed to changing the face of the Conservative Party. And part of that, and he used the language to himself, he wanted, a conser- he wanted a cultural revolution, literally in the Conservative Party, in the way that it looked, sounded and felt. And at that stage, I thought that I would give it a go and actually try to stand all over again for what would eventually become the 2010 general election. So I went through quite a battle. I had to apply for a range of constituencies. I put my name forward. And um, it is like a huge job interview for every constituency you go for. I applied for 21 constituencies from the summer of 2006 to the autumn of 2006 travelled the country quite assiduously, going for these job interviews with various local parties, um, with the chairman of various associations, with local constituency parties. And I did okay, you know, you get through various rounds, it's like various stages of a job interview. And um, I was selected for Whitton in November 2006. Just at the same time, I was working for a company called Diageo, which is based at the time, not that far away from here, actually, in Henrietta Place, worked in corporate affairs for them, and I had a global job for them. Um, at that same time, they were thinking of placing me um, in a post in East Africa, because I travelled a lot and I, I did a lot of global work. And literally, the day that I was selected for my constituency in Whitton was a day that they were ready to sort of like send me abroad as well. You know, and at that stage, for me, that told me everything um, about what I had started to achieve professionally and as an individual, and as a woman, I guess, in public life and in the corporate world. That actually, you can, if you are determined and if you are focused, you can actually give it a go and aspire to do what you want to do. I had the choice of two jobs, basically, at that stage, either staying in the corporate world or actually doing something that was totally unconventional and standing for Parliament in a constituency that I was pretty certain to win and become the Conservative Party's first female Asian MP. So that's how I got there. That was in 2006, you may have noticed, and the election wasn't until 2010. So I had four years of campaigning, four years of building my local party, and it was an incredible experience. It went with a lot of challenges. You learn from every challenge, and you learn from every setback, but I am able to say that I have, you know, not just made it through, but hopefully, having got myself elected in 2010, I think now the trend will be that there will be others who will follow after me, um, not just as Asian MPs, but actually female MPs as well. Um, and not just in the Conservative Party, but in other parties as well. So that's a bit about my journey. I know that we'll do some Q&A later on, so I'll be very happy to take some questions. But I think, you know, ultimately, we can start breaking those glass ceilings. We can get there. And this is all now about changing those social norms and making sure that women are out there in the front line doing all the things that people said that we couldn't do in the past. So thank you.